So I want to tell you a little bit about uh, random graphs and why I think um, their rigidity properties are interesting. And um, so the first question is, what's a random graph? And I think what most people know is this random uh, graph model where you're considering the probability space of all graphs on n vertices in which each edge is chosen independently with some probability p. And that probability space is denoted by this uh, curly g n p. And I want to just show you what um, a standard uh, theorem in random graphs looks like. So you say, take a graph from this probability space. And now the probability is actually given by some function of n. And it sort of looks strange, but uh, if you have ever read um, papers by Erdős and uh, Erdős was really the one that started this random graph stuff. It's full of these logs and log logs and other functions. And so you sort of um, try to comprehend how this probability is given as a function of the number of vertices. And so, okay, uh, it's there, right? And don't overlook that divided by n. But as the vertices, uh, the number of vertices goes to infinity, we want to say something. So it's important that there is such a function w of n that goes to infinity uh, divided by n. And uh, so, if you have this log n k times log log n, and k is an integer greater or equal to two, and this limit as n tends to infinity of w of n goes to infinity, then you can actually say something. Then given any fixed integer t, denote by s sub t, for example, the set of vertices of g of degree at most t. So you take your random graph g, out of this probability space and you fix your integer t no matter what it is, then as n tends to infinity, you can say something about these probabilities, namely s k minus one, right? And no matter uh, if your k is given, then s sub k minus one will be empty. No two vertices of s sub t those are the vertices of your random graph G that have degree T, uh, at most T, T or smaller. They are far apart, right? They are not joined by a path of length um, less than or equal to two. And also, if you take out the vertices of low degree, where well, low degree, I mean, your t could be as large as it wants to be, but if you take them out, then the rest is t connected. So if you take out the ones smaller than your given t, then the rest is actually t connected. So in some sense, that's quite astounding. And why did this get my attention a long time ago? Because, um, of this uh, wonderful theorem by Lovas and Yemini that you probably went over in the course already, I don't quite remember, that um, in the plane, every six connected graph is rigid, right? And this was actually the paper that introduced the rigidity matroid. Lovas recognized that the count for generic rigidity in the plane is actually a metroidal count. And then proved using a nice formula for the rank function that every six connected graph is rigid, right? So you see, um, and what, what always sort of surprised me about this um, theorem is that uh, the rigidity is proven with um, a contradiction that isn't tight. Right, so that leaves room for improvement. And what was not clear to us when we wrote the book back in the old uh, dark ages of the last millennium, what is a natural property? 
in sort of this probabilistic sense, right? If you take a large random graph, is it going to be rigid? Is it going to be, if it has enough edges to be rigid, is it going to be globally rigid or is globally rigid the odd man out? Or is it such a natural property that every random graph is going to have? So random graphs are in some sense difficult, right? You have to sort of comprehend that probability function P. And I think that um, I like this concept of random regular graphs where this is now a completely different probability space. We are looking at graphs on n vertices that have degree d. So all d regular graphs on n vertices, and they are chosen with uniform probability. Right, so you're considering uh, all of the graphs on n vertices, and usually in the model, they are labeled graphs or so labeled vertices and they all have degree D. And um, a sequence of graph properties, just to introduce that notation, um, holds asymptotically almost truly in the probability space that you specify. If the limit as n tends to infinity, so the number of vertices tends to infinity, um, if the probability that A sub n holds is going to one. So this is an important definition that we are going to use as asymptotically almost truly. So if you take a large graph, then you can rest assured that the probability is pretty large if um, that your prob property holds if the limit tends to infinity. If the limit is equal to one, as n tends to infinity. Um, Bridget, uh, yes. I've got a question about the previous slide. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you've mentioned, uh, yeah, uh, do, do, do. GND is the probability space of all d regular graphs on n vertices. Is this up to automorphism or are the, the vertices labeled? The vertices are labeled. Okay. But I'm told by the uh, random graph people that. Uh, asymptotically, it usually doesn't make too much of a difference, but the labeled versions are much easier to count. Okay. That is true. Right, so it's, it's much easier to work and get the, um, the probabilities in the labeled world. And we probably get to some computations so that you see how this works. Okay. But usually there's not much difference in the long run, even though isomorphism is hard. Right, so to get a hold of the asymptotics is much easier in the labeled world. All right, All right. thank you. And here are some well-known results. So this uh, Luchak guy, um, I really don't know how to pronounce his name and there's an, a dash in the L, but uh, he has marvelously interesting results. So he says D, sub, uh, D of N, so this, um, degree d, the regularity of the graph, can be a function of the number of vertices between 3 and n to the uh, 0 0.02, small anyway, right? Then the graph, if you take one at random from your deregular world, then it is deconnected asymptotically almost truly. And so if you say, okay, I want my D of N to just be a constant three, then you say the graph is deconnected asymptotically almost truly. And it's sort of strange and Wormald remarked on this in his survey paper that I would strongly recommend it's sort of a 60 page paper also from the last millennium, but it's very good to get started in this random graph business. And he remarks that this is actually strange that it should be harder to prove for larger degrees, but it is. So it's um, actually easier to prove for the small degrees than for the large degrees that the graph is deconnected. 
So another uh, nice theorem here is, um, and that's by Wormald himself. So he fixes D and K. And both of them are numbers larger than or equal to three. Then he says the probabilities that um, some uh, that, that of the properties for some G in this random deregular world. So they behave asymptotically all the same. For example, uh, the property that G is cyclically K vertex connected. So and D is fixed and K is fixed. Then or of um, cyclically K edge connected or cyclically K vertex connected and of girth at least K over <clears throat> D minus two. And so I can fix D and I fix K and K could be larger than D or smaller than D. But um, now I want you to sort of examine this and get a feeling for it, right? Considering that Lova's theorem, for example, where you say, I want six connectivity to prove rigidity, right? And the question is, um, how do I get my six connectivity? Uh, can I... Uh, cyclically K vertex connected. Does everybody know what that means? What uh, is that? No, I don't think so. Right. So what, what you mean by cyclically K vertex connected is something um, sort of strange. So you want to remove K vertices and disconnect the graph, but you want to disconnect in such a fashion that each part, each one of the at least two parts has contains a cycle in it. So it's not just um, a, a singleton vertex or a bunch of singleton vertices or just a couple of trees, but it contains a cycle. Each part that you have left of the graph contains a cycle. So you don't want to separate off trivial vertex sets or something loosely connected. The, the parts should have contain a cycle. So does that make sense? So if you, for example, go back, if I go back to my, my initial graph uh, here, right? This would be uh, cyclically um, quite a few edge connected, right? So if you want a cycle and it has lots of triangles left on one side and left on the other, then you would have to remove quite a few edges someplace, right? So uh, maybe we want to separate uh, edges here and edges over there, but it's sort of highly cyclically edge connected, but it's only cyclically four vertex connected because you can remove say two vertices here and two vertices on the bottom and then still the left and the right part have a cycle contained in it. So the, this is not a, a random graph, of course, right? So it would not uh, qualify for that theorem. This is um, not satisfying cyclically K vertex connected, but certainly the cyclic K edge connected is uh, true for a larger K than for um, then for the edges, right? So, but uh, now what's the point here? So if I have my degree D fixed in my random regular graph, then how vertex connected and how edge connected can it be at most? So in the ordinary connectivity sense, a graph of degree D cannot be more than deconnected. But look at that, right? So I can actually choose K larger than D. And I actually do get somewhere if I look at this um, uh, asymptotics, because my I here goes from three to 
k over d minus 2. That means uh, if I, for example, look at uh, degree um, 4, right? And so in, in the plane, if I take a 4 regular graph, I can hope that it is rigid. Right, because the average degree in a rigid graph in the plane is four. Yes. So if I now choose my k to be six, thinking of the Lovas theorem, then what happens to six over d minus two? Six over d minus two is actually just three. So this product is empty. That means every four regular random graph will be cyclically six vertex connected with probability one, right? So this tends to one, it, the, the product is empty and it will be cyclically six edge connected and it will have growth at least K over D minus two. So it will have growth at least three, which is not surprising, right? So uh, the graph on the cover page has uh, certainly lots of triangles, but also average degree uh, a lot larger than four. Anyway, so you can look at this um, uh, theorem and say, I, I get quite a bit out of it because maybe cyclically six vertex connected or six edge connected is enough to obtain lo local rigidity of such a four regular graph, right? And so here's the theorem that we proved a while ago with um, Bill Jackson, who knows quite a bit about uh, random graphs. So we have, um, this is the theorem in the ordinary random graph world where we have this probability function k log log n and a w. And if k is equal to two, then the graph is asymptotically almost truly rigid. And if k is equal to three in my probability function, then g is globally rigid, asymptotically almost truly. But in the regular, well, actually, maybe, I want to mention these theorems first, but uh, maybe I want to, well, no. Maybe we want to go back uh, later for the uh, random regular graph world. I want to just mention a couple of more results in this for random regular graphs. Namely, this interesting theorem by McDiarmid and Reed for fixed D, the linear arboricity of uh, a random D regular graph is asymptotically almost truly the ceiling of one half times D plus one. So if we look at um, a random four regular graph, then that ceiling would be one half times um, ceiling of five halves, right, three. So I could, um, with asymptotically almost truly decompose the edge set into three paths, right? And so if you are thinking of um, looking at um, tree decomposition theorems, and you probably have learned that, right, that they, and I think I, I mentioned this later, that a rigid graph has a decomposition into two spanning trees or doubling any edge, right? It's the edge disjoint union of spanning, two spanning trees, such that no two subgraphs have the same span. And uh, a path is a very nice tree, right? That, uh, that is sort of easy to use. Uh, if, if no two subtrees have the same span. 
And Wormald proved this amazing theorem, which I really like, right? That um, in the deregular random graph world, um, a graph is the edge, uh, any deregular graph is actually the edge disjoint union of Hamilton cycles if D is even and is um, the edge disjoint union of Hamilton cycles plus a perfect matching if D is odd. And then this is, in my opinion, a great uh, theorem and maybe I can try to annotate and I'll try this. But if I asked you, use this theorem to just draw me a random graph. So let's see if I can actually draw this. So what would you do? Right, so uh, draw me a random four regular graph on seven vertices. Right, and then you say, okay, and, and I draw the vertices. And I don't know why it's blue, but uh, so be it. And, and this is, uh, I said seven, right? But it doesn't really matter. And then I would start out with a Hamilton cycle because after all it's the edge disjoint union of a Hamilton cycle. And now I can think of one, two, three, four, and the random labeled is good, right? And now instead of um, using this permutation, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, going around in the circle, I take a random permutation of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and draw in my second Hamilton cycle. So maybe I can, but uh, I don't know how to choose the colors, right? So I draw in something else and you can name the, the permutation for me, maybe some student could draw in a, a second Hamilton cycle. Well, maybe I can do it. I didn't, I'm not doing it very randomly, but nevertheless. Um, now I have a four regular graph. Right, and it's the edge disjoint union of two Hamilton cycles. It's not really terribly random, but you can check it out. It is actually a cycle in the two-dimensional rigidity, actually another cycle that contains lots of cycles. Right, and uh, the nice thing in the plane is if you introduce um, vertices right at the crossing point, then it's still sort of, um, it, it's now a string of triangles and you can study its rigidity properties. And you have talked about partial two trees and all of this, right? So if you delete um, three um, edges here, then you get a string of triangles. So it's a two tree. And so this is really a cycle of triangles. And uh, in my cover picture, I had actually a cycle of tetrahedra. But if you ignore these um, vertices of degree four that I inserted later, right, that it's really sort of um, easier to see that under those circumstances, the uh, connectivity um, is four, right? Because it's a four regular graph, but the, um, cyclic connectivity goes up to six. In the vertex sense, not if I insert these extra vertices and in the edge sense. Yeah. In the edge sense, even here, if I insert those extra vertices. But you can convince yourself in the other case, it's sort of harder to see where are the, uh, the cycles, but you have to remove quite a few vertices in order to get uh, the graph separated into two pieces that contain still a cycle. So uh, it, in my opinion, this is a great theorem, right? Which tells you maybe uh, for connectivity 
of the ran in the random graph world is already enough for rigidity. So let's see. Okay. Get my mouse back and clear the drawings. So other properties of uh, random graphs are actually uh, that are well studied are the um, uh, spectral properties of the adjacency matrix or the various other matrices, the Laplacian is usually looked at. So the, uh, the spectral properties of the Laplacians are um, something that is shared by Cayley graphs. Certain Cayley graphs, in particular Ramanujan graphs, have the same spectral properties that the, the um, the random graphs have, right? And these Ramanujan graphs, they are really large. And in with respect to prop, uh, spectral properties, they behave like random graphs. And I tested one of these Ramanujan graphs of degree six. The smallest one actually has 6,800 vertices for its rigidity properties in three space, right? In three space, you want to have minimum degree or average degree six for a rigid graph. And sure enough, it is uh, rigid, even rigid with respect to removal of one vertex. So it has nice properties. So if you want to have um, a nice large example of a, a rigid graph, right, that is fairly sparse, then you can actually use Cayley graphs. And um, Bethe lattices are, um, well studied, Cayley trees are all studied. And you have this whole machinery of combinatorial group theory. So then you have this whole machinery of quotient graphs and coset diagrams at your disposal. And what is nice about these, uh, because they are Cayley graphs and because you know that they are vertex transitive, you have an easy time setting up the rigidity matrix. So, but the vertex transitivity, however, is absolutely non-random. So you can show that random graphs have asymptotically almost truly trivial automorphism group. So that's in some sense, in my opinion, very interesting. You know, what is shared by these uh, objects, Cayley graphs are also Hamiltonian, or there are some open problems and people are studying these properties. So you can certainly know that they don't have small cycles. So the girth is large, that's along the lines of the, uh, the random graph people, the regularity is there, the connectivity is there, the rigidity is there. But I think those are interesting classes of graphs to study. And rigid or percolation on these graphs is well studied. So let's see how to apply this in, in some sense to the rigidity world. I've drawn here the Cayley graph of the group AB is equal to BA. So that's a, a commutative group where A to the fourth is equal to B to the fourth is equal to one. So the smallest cycle is of size four and I've embedded it on the torus. So the red edges are just identified and the blue edges are identified. And then you can study that graph. It's again, just a four regular graph and it's globally rigid. Uh, then uh, here is um, my string of triangles and I've decomposed it into two Hamilton cycles. The red one sort of goes around and the blue one, usually if there is a decomposition into Hamilton cycles. There are many decompositions into Hamilton cycles. And what you can study is the cycles in the rigidity matroid, and you find that all the dependent sets are rather large. They contain almost all the vertices, all but one vertex, or 
they contain all the vertices and all but three edges or any a three edge set that doesn't create a vertex of degree two, you can delete and get a rigidity cycle. So all the rigidity cycles of this object are large. And um, now you can push this into three dimensions. So you can take a five regular graph. And so I've put in a perfect matching in yellow. And if you take a six regular graph, that's the string of tetrahedra in three space. So that now contains three it decomposes into three Hamilton cycles, the yellow one, the red one, and the blue one. And of course, it's perfectly uh, globally rigid, even in three space, because it's this cycle of tetrahedra. And it has some of the random properties, but not all of them. And here are these uh, theorems that I wanted, or should have probably mentioned earlier. So. These are the well-known theorems of um, two-dimensional rigidity matroid, uh, matroids, an edge subset of a graph is a cycle if and only if it decomposes into two trees such that each endpoint of an edge in C is in both trees and no two subtrees have the same span. So, that means C has a proper decomposition into two trees, both spanning the vertex set of C. So the um, Hamiltonian cycles give you actually a tree decomposition by leaving out two edges, one from each Hamilton cycle, right? Then you get two Hamilton paths. And it's very easy to check if the Hamilton path have the same span. That's only if the graph is not four connected. Well, actually, just so if you have four separating vertices, then you could potentially have it. But um, if this is not the case, so it's very easy to check if the decomposition into the two Hamilton paths is proper or not. And then you have your rigidity properties from just that one. And there's this uh, theorem that we proved with Bill Jackson, a graph is globally rigid if and only, well, actually no, this is the, the theorem, the Jackson, uh, Jordan theorem, the graph G is globally rigid, if and only if it's either a complete graph on at most three vertices or it's both three connected and edge two rigid. So if one can show that uh, the graph is edge two rigid, then it's globally rigid. If it's um, both three connected and edge two rigid. So it's very easy to show that the string of triangles or the decomposition of into uh, or the graph consisting of two Hamilton cycles is actually globally rigid because every edge is actually on every vertex is contained in a rigidity cycle. So it's edge too rigid. You can leave off any three edges in fact, right? And it is four connected. So these uh, examples are actually easy to show to be globally rigid. So one warning though for these proper tree decompositions. So if I start out with my Cayley graph and I sort of subdivide four edges and put in say a wheel, right? I still have a four regular graph and it still has a two tree decomposition, the red one and the blue one, but it's not a proper two tree decomposition anymore because the red subtree here uh, consisting of the three edges of this um, four wheel and the blue, that's a subtree. Those two subtrees have the same span. So it has a small cycle here in the rigidity matroid. And this is happening very often also in engineering, right? You think you're reinforcing, uh, fixing something by uh, putting these little patches of um, uh, wheels here that look pretty rigid, but you actually weaken the graph. 
this is only uh, just rigid, right? So it's, um, uh, and this one actually will not be rigid. And so we are um, increasing the number of vertices, but you're not increasing the count, but you're increasing the number of small cycles that this object has. And you are decreasing the fact that what you started out with was globally rigid. So what we want to avoid in the global rigid world is these small uh, clumps of um, cycles, right? So in a random deregular graph, they are with high probability deconnected and cyclically 3D minus six connected, asymptotically almost truly. And they are the edge disjoint union of D over two Hamilton disjoint Hamilton cycles if D is even and the edge disjoint union of Hamilton cycles plus a perfect matching if D is odd. And that leads, and that is the paper with Jackson, uh, to the fact that if D is greater than or equal to four, then, and G is a random D regular graph on N vertices, then it's asymptotically almost truly globally rigid. So this is in some sense, justifying global rigidity as the uh, quality that a random graph has as soon as it has enough edges to be actually rigid, then the global rigidity will kick in, in some sense, for free, right? In the random graph world, global rigidity is the natural property. And uh, most likely, right, if you take a graph that in the long run has large enough degree, then you are, getting global rigidity for free. Rigidity and global rigidity more or less kick in at the same time. This is something that has been uh, observed on these beefy lattices and also on the rigidity uh, and the percolation of the, um, the, the um, no, why am I not saying this correctly? Well, so what, what am I looking for? This is just annoying that I'm losing the, the Cayley graphs, right? Cayley so graph, this, um, right. this percolation on Cayley graphs is actually well studied. And um, so, but I wanted to say that these properties that one wants to study, and you are trying to, when you are talking about percolation, you start out uh, start out with an empty graph, and you drop in the edges one at a time, and you are dropping them in under the condition that you want to create a deregular graph. Then uh, nothing will happen in the beginning, right? You won't get uh, rigid subgraphs, one, but all of a sudden, right? You will start to get you will you will not see rigid graphs growing, but all of a sudden you will get a large rigid subgraph and all of a sudden you will get large stressed regions. And that sort of um, uh, rigidity transition that uh, is called first order because it doesn't, you don't see the rigid components growing, the rigidity kicks in um, suddenly. That, that first order, Phase transition that has absolutely nothing to do with first order rigidity. That's a different sort of meaning of the usage of the word. Right. So order. nothing to do I'm with sorry, first order but, rigidity, right? Yeah. But you are looking at rigid components. And the rigid components remain singleton edges, little triangles, right, for a long time uh, here and there. But you don't see, like in uh, connectivity percolation, you see 
the trees growing, but not here, right? So that uh, phase transition for rigidity is distinct from the phase transition in the conic, a rigidity phase transition is different from connectivity phase transition. And um, something that is fairly well studied in random regular graphs is what's called the three core. That's a largest vertex induced subgraph of minimum degree three. And um, so there are all these formulas tossed around and I don't want to spend too much time on this, but um, the number of edges in the three core divided by the number of overall vertices has a formula and uh, it uh, contains this probability P by which you percolate the edges in and the number of vertices divided by N, uh, complicated formula and you can compute all of this, but um, uh, then you can find what the three core is. So for regularity four, the three core is absolutely empty. And there are no vertex induced subgraphs with degree at least three. Doesn't happen. For D is equal to five, then when you take out edges with a certain probability, then uh, we get the number of vertices is um, so these, these objects are fairly large, 0.57, so more than half of the edges for uh, this uh, three core of a five regular graph. And you can do the same thing for the six regular graphs, but I don't want to uh, do too much of this. I want to just give you a flavor of which computations are going in if you are, uh, wanting to study, say, rigidity percolation in the rigid uh, deregular graph world or in the deregular random graph world. So what um, we'll, uh, Wormald uses is the pairing model of random deregular graphs. What you start out with, if you have number of vertices n, you start out with n bins. And each bin contains D points, right? D is your regularity degree. And what you want to do is um, you want to choose a random pairing of the points and that gives you your random deregular graph. So you pair these points off in any old fashion. And if your pair contains one point from bin one and one point from bin three, then vertex one and vertex three are adjacent, but right? they have an edge from vertex one to vertex three. Of course, what you also get with um, in this model is actually not necessarily a simple graph because you can actually join two vertices from the same bin, and then you get a loop, or you can join pairs of vertices of the same two pins, and then you get parallel edges, but you get them in the long run, this won't make any difference. So for the asymptotics, this is irrelevant. So what we want now to do is to compute, say the expected number of subgraphs of minimum degree three, so something like the, the, the three core of, um, and I want to specify how many vertices I want to have in my subgraph and how many edges I want to have in my subgraph. So in order to be a rigid subgraph, if it on J vertices, it ought to have two times J minus K um, edges. Right, and you will see that the K is really not uh, coming in in a, uh, a reasonable fashion, right? It will more or less drop out of the consideration. And that will mean that with a rigid subgraph, something that is large enough to be rigid, then it might as well also be globally rigid 
in a sense, right? But uh, this is just sort of the initial counting. Are there subgraphs of the correct size and edge density that qualify for potentially being a rigid subgraph? And we want to take these in an M edge subgraph of this deregular graph, random deregular graph. So I want to prescribe how large my edge density has to be in order to get one of these um, graphs that I want that qualify for potentially a rigid subgraph. So to compute this expected number, right? we just really use the spin model and say, I want J vertices in my rigid, in my potentially rigid subgraph that potentially has enough edges on J vertices to satisfy the count. And so I chose, first choose my, my bins. Then I have this mysterious function f of j. I want to know how to choose the vertices for the for the matching, but um, that will be explained a little later. But once I have chosen my vertices, then I can do the matching of two j minus k um, edges, and uh, so I get my two j minus k edges. And now I match what's left over. First, I choose high vertices that um, my vertices of F are, uh, my vertices of the subgraph H are connected to in the outside world. So maybe I should uh, make a schematic here of what's going on. Uh, to draw. So I have my, I hope I can do this nicely. I have my subgraph H here and I have chosen the vertices of my subgraph and I've chosen the matching edges. So I have specified how to choose my subgraph. And now I want to see if I of these uh, vertices uh, sort of um, might be connected to something in my M edge subgraph uh, here that um, I haven't uh, specified yet. So maybe none of them are. So I can go from zero to all the rest of the vertices that I haven't looked at yet. And once I've chosen these, uh, what I is, right? Then I can permute those. So that takes care of the I factorial. And then to get my remaining M edges, so I get I edges from that sort of thing, but um, the remaining M minus 2J minus K edges in my M edge graph, I just match off. And I divide the whole thing by the total number of M edge subgraphs of my random deregular graph. So that's the, dn, I have dn points to choose from. I choose 2m from them for my uh, um, m regular, um, m edge subgraph and I match them. Right, so this is the expected number. Now this looks like a total mess, right? And you wonder how you can actually get some computation going. Um, the stuff, but it's actually sort of the, these random graph people have a lot of experience. And so what uh, Wormald did, he said, well, let's first get rid of the sum, right? So the sum goes from I, uh, goes from zero to um, dj minus 4j minus 2k or uh, plus 2k. So let's first replace this I by some I zero that maximizes this expression, right? Because this will be uh, sort of taking the average, right? And replacing the sum by just using this particular I zero. And that's done 
with the Stirling's approximation for the factorials, and then you can sort of approximate all these binomial coefficients. And um, now you really want to concentrate on computing this f of j, and then you do this um, in a sense, what you want this subgraph to be, you specified that the subgraph has to have degree at least three at each vertex. So I want to look at the generating function and I want to just say, I have a deregular graph to choose my, to, to find my subgraph H in. So I want to have this generating function X plus one to the D. But um, so X means I take the edge and, um, or the plus one, I don't take the edge. And I want to take at least three edges. So I want to subtract the negative one. I want to subtract one on the dx, so the, where x occurs to the exponent one and to the exponent two. So they want from each vertex of my subgraph at least three edges out. Right? And so I want to take the jth power of that polynomial and look at the coefficient of x to the four j minus k because I want to choose four um, j minus k edges. In want to have that number of edges in my subgraph and I don't want any vertices of degree less than four. Right? And so I want to estimate this uh, um, coefficient and how do I estimate it? Because uh, and I know this is sort of a high degree polynomial and X is positive. And so I can say that this is um, less than or equal to the coefficient. Uh, if I divide by my um, X to the four J minus two K, I will get the exponent plus something more. Uh, the, the coefficient plus something else, right? And so to get a reasonable estimate for this W, take the logarithm, take the derivative, and then you can say uh, your X is P prime of X divided by P of X. And that happens to be approximately equal to four. So you see that's where the K actually starts to make little difference. And so now you compute, right? So f of j becomes this um, uh, expression. And for d is equal to four, this equa uh, equation that I showed on the previous thing has no solution. So if I use this p of x, then I get, uh, I compute p prime of x divided by whatever, right? And I get no solution. For d is equal to five, I do get a solution. It's actually an x zero of uh, square root of 10, right? You compute and for d is equal to six, then you get um, a solution you want to one, the one that is closest to one. So, uh, but it's all done on maple, right? And you get these, um, graphs where you graph the log logarithm divided by n as a function of m over n. So that's the number of edges in the deregular random graph that you percolate in. And the j over n is the fraction, the number of vertices that you allow in your subgraph. And now you ask yourself, when is there such a graph and how large is it? And you see that for um, uh, M over N is actually sort of um, where the probability starts to get larger than zero is when M over N and J over N are actually both fairly large, a little bit more relaxed for six regular and now you can also look at these uh, m over n as a function of j over n graphed. So what does this mean here? If you are looking for uh, average um, 
valence four, right? So H density two, then the size here for degree five will be my, my J, my subgraph will be between 0.64 and um, 0.95. So they will be fairly large, right? And it's a little bit better over here where they are a little bit small um, when you get a larger range of sizes of subgraphs, but there are no really small ones, right? For the edge density that you want. But uh, those are sort of the dirty computations that you need to do. And, but it all makes sense if you're uh, looking at these uh, random graph papers. And so this intuition from uh, the random deregular graphs that there aren't any rigid subgraphs to speak of that reinforces this um, uh, notion that the rigidity percolation will actually be first order. So rigidity properties will kick in suddenly and you won't see any small rigid subgraphs someplace. So with high probability, but um, this is something that people want to know, but uh, it needs a little bit more work, right? So that um, this always happens for degree four, for the small degree, it's actually much simpler than for the larger degrees, because of course there are more sort of um, rigid subgraphs that you intend to find or that you could potentially find, right? And uh, nothing said that th those were rigid subgraphs. Those were just dense enough in order to qualify. So there's a, a lot of work to still be done, but I want to just end with um, even yet another notion of um, the random graph world. Here I've drawn the sort of Kagomi lattice as a, in a geometric fashion by unit circles that touch. And this is yet another random graph model, this geom NR, the probability space of all graphs on N vertices in which the vertices are distributed uniformly at random in the unit square. And each pair of vertices of distance at most R are joined by an edge. So why am I uh, alerting to this? So, so far we have not at all used the random stuff for any kind of geometry, right? The embedding has never come in. We only have counted and there was no space involved. It was just probabilities and um, counting. But here, this is a random uh, graph concept using the geometry. So now you take the unit square and you put your uh, number of points in distributed uniformly at random and you put an edge between two points if their distance is at most your given r. And now that uh, it was shown and the bibliography is somewhere n pi r squared right, is equal to log n and again the log log and the w's are coming in for a fixed integer k and this Wn is again a function that goes to infinity, then G is asymptotically almost truly K connected. Now you can apply this to the rigidity world and say, if your K is nine, then you can assure global rigidity. And now the question, is can you relax this somehow to get rigidity? Can you do better than nine? And so you can get your hands uh, dirty on that one if you try to get a homework example, right? But this is something that we asked at the end of the Jackson paper and you have the bibliographies there. So I would definitely recommend that you start with this uh, survey paper by Nick Warmold. And it's really a nice paper, very readable that gets you into the subject. 
And I've mentioned also a couple of uh, this Kaylee trees, I think, uh, are something nice. And I think those um, Ramanujan graphs of Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak are something that should be studied for rigidity purposes. And uh, Bill Jackson uh, was really a lot of fun to write this paper. And I think he's working with Warmold now on some of these rigidity questions. And I wonder how far they have gotten. And the three core, I think is also a readable paper by Cooper. And that gets used very often, his concept and equations applied in many different aspects. But I think that should get you started in thinking randomly and thinking of global rigidity as the natural property. And if you want deregular random graphs, start out with uh, Hamilton cycles and perfect matchings, and you'll see something. So, Thank you and enjoy the rest of the course. Thanks, Brigitte, that, that was really great. Um, so I'll open the floor for questions. I know we're, we're slightly past the hour, but um, I think, I hope Brigitte is happy to answer any questions if there are sure. any. No problem. So, so maybe I can start with a question. Um, it, it's not completely related to what you, what you talked about, but um, if we wanted to say something about the rigidity of a random regular graph in three dimensions, asymptotically almost surely, that then probably in general, it's just very hard. But what if we wanted to look at a random regular graph and work out whether it was rigid in the, the cofactor matroid or, the, or in, in the maximal abstract free rigidity matroid instead? Would that be a, a tractable target? So the other question is what, um what um, random properties are you actually shooting for? So I think the, the cycle decomposition is something that can be applied to rigidity, right? And the connectivity condition is something that can get applied to rigidity. That's why these things are, are uh, nice. So in, in I think in the cofactor matroid, you also have no connectivity condition yet. It's just um, uh, conjectures. So the question is which one of the, um, <coughs> the well-studied properties can you combine to imply rigidity? So, so maybe I'm wrong, but I, I thought in the, the recent clinch Jackson Tanagawa papers, they confirmed that 12 connected implied rigid in the, the C21 cofactor matroid. And right, so, so I was yeah. taking a look at the old Macholi at random graph and seeing if it was 12 connected. And... Right, so the, this definitely can be applied. So the 12 connectivity, you would say, is. Uh, definitely enough in the random graph world, because if you have average degree, or if you have six Hamilton cycles, right, that graph will definitely be asymptotically almost truly rigid in the cofactor matroid. Right, so that is, but 12 is most likely not um, best possible, right? I think you can relax this quite a bit. So maybe for the cofactor matroid, you can get a, a better uh, decomposition into say Hamilton cycles and prove the, the rigidity. Right, so I, I would think that six connectivity, I sort of, I fearlessly conjecture that six connectivity is enough for the cofactor matroid and the um, the um, for a, for a 3D rigidity matrix for a random regular graph, right? But you have the 12 connectivity for a 12 regular random graph, right? But I don't think it's best possible, but I think the six is best possible. 
And again, I would not know what, what extra thing to you need. And maybe you can do this um, again with um, the, cyclically vertex connected, right? So that you get your, in, in the lower dimensional rigidity matroid, your cycles left over. And that might help, right? But it would be an interesting thing to see how to apply this in, in higher dimensions. But I think that uh, uh, Walter doesn't believe six connectivity is enough, but I think that the sort of computational evidence has it that six connectivity is enough. Okay, thanks. For, for in the random world. So I, I have I have two questions that are that are kind of related. They're motivated by um, an application in statistics, but how difficult would it be to um I guess just like begin thinking about, okay, so, you know, take one of your random graph models and then ask like, what is the expected um, minimum D such that your random graph is independent in the D dimensional rigidity matroid or maybe give some like upper bound on that. And then also what is the um, maximum D such that it's globally rigid in um, D dimensions, and then also giving a lower bound for this. Like, I don't know, are, are either of these questions you think sort of like within reach? And so I, I, I'm a little bit confused about the D. So D in your case is the dimension oh. or the regularity? Yeah, 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 uh, the dimension. The dimension. Right, so again, this, uh, in my opinion, the deregularity, or if you want rigidity in dimension D, then the regularity should be um, equal to the, to the dimension. That, that sort of, uh, that should be enough. Okay. Right, because what, what you are subtracting is uh, uh, of no consequence. Right? So that's, that's asymptotic you're talking about. Asymptotic. asymptotic. Yeah. Yeah. So th that's what I would shoot for. But uh, I'm not sure about the, about the tools. Mm -hmm. right? what, what gets the tools so easy in, in dimension two is that um, the counting is enough. Gotcha. Right, and cycles are rigid. Right, but independence, you are probably right, right? Independence should be easier, right? When you're definitely under the threshold. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah, thanks. So this is um, not a question, more a comment. Um, the, you mentioned Dramanujan graphs, um, and me and Sebastian uh, Chaba and Zhao Feng Gu have a paper recently where we've shown that every k regular for k bigger than or equal to eight, a Dramanujan graph is globally rigid. So we do in, have that result in three space. In two D, in two D, not three space. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. that would be a nice result. And we we do have some results. Right, so they are actually. Yeah, they are globally rigid. Yeah. Right, and they're globally rigid, but I think that that holds for three space just the same. So that so so that's consistent with the. Right, so this this is actually consistent with the with the random graph world in with general. The, with the idea that Ramanujan graphs sort of act like random graphs. Right, so the Ramanujan graph. Although they're not random. Right, so. The, yeah, the they question, have like the randomest in a way. <laughs> right, so they have this wonderful eigenvalue that shows the connectivity. Mm. Right, so are you going just for the connectivity? Um, it's just, it, no, it's slightly, so if you just go for connectivity with the eigenvalue, you have to get very high regularity. It, it has to be quite large. Um, I, I think it's like, um, but, but 
yeah, there's another way of doing it. It's kind of related to Bill Jackson's. Um, Bill Jackson and Tibor have that paper on. Uh, was it six edge connected, four edge connected, two edge connected? It kind of stems from methods related to that, and then some other stuff was used to get a spectral result, and mm -hmm. then the result popped out from that. Right, and I, I think that um, in three D, that's also the, the Ramanujan graphs are great to study, and I think that um, even the, the six regular ones are perfectly vertex by rigid in three space. Right? I, I, just from that one example, but I think it's, it's quite evident right, that the rigidity matrix, even if you deleted one vertex had full rank. And right? it's just really a, a nice spectacular thing. And so did you use the automorphism group at all? No, it, it wasn't used at all. It purely comes from the, just the spectrum and using um, spectral methods, that's it. Right, so, but, but I'd like you uh, suggest to you because of the high automorphism group of these graphs that uh, you could use that for the rigidity of the, um, uh, the under certain automorphism groups, right? With respect to symmetry. And they should behave very nicely. Okay. Even, even if you do the symmetric embedding. Right, so yeah. that, that would, I would find that interesting, right? Because they have this high automorphism group. Yeah, okay. That'd be something. And then you would get very interesting that are rigid even under the condition that they have they are very symmetrically embedded. I didn't look at the the quotient graphs. Yeah, okay. And they are large, right? So you get huge graphs with a huge automorphism group and they should look beautiful. Yeah. I think you're probably right, yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to see that paper. Is it published already? Um, so we've got the paper on the spectral results is already out, and we're currently doing a paper on Ramanujan graphs in general. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah, sort of results. So the, the looking at symmetry is a good idea, which we haven't considered yet. So, so um, uh, keep me in the loop, right? Send me the paper when it's done. <laughs> okay. I'd like to see it. Can I ask a, a naive question about Ramanujan graphs? Because I'm not sure I understand what they are. If it, pick, you can pick whatever dimension you like. Does there exist a Ramanujan graph that is a flexible circuit? Well, um, maybe Sean can answer this. So they are um, generated by prime numbers, pairs of prime numbers that have certain properties. So six regular is possible because seven is a prime number and six is seven minus one, right? Uh, so, so we don't, don't have to be generated. E minus one regular and there is another Q, right? So you write the group in terms of the generators uh, generated by particular pairs of prime numbers. So they don't have to be generated this way. This is just one, this is one of the very few constructions that we know of Ramanujan graphs. They're kind of like, um, right, right, right. They, they exist purely on their spectral properties. It's to do with the highest eigenvalue. Um, but we, we only know that they exist. Uh, yeah, we know they exist for certain prime numbers of degree. And we know that we can always find bipartite Ramanujan graphs, which is like slightly weaker, but we don't, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, very, they're very abstract in some ways. They're not known if they fully exist for all values. At the moment. But, but in the Lubotsky, Phillips and Sarnak paper, they get actually described with generators. Yeah, so they construct- the Activity graphs, right, of, of these groups. And yeah. they, they explicitly compute the spectrum. Yes, yeah, that's a what method of doing it, yeah. Um, I, they've got like a certain type of name, um, um, type of graphs, I can't remember. But 
they're also like vertex transitive and everything. They've got loads of conditions. They're very nice graphs. Right, and they have all these uh, large girth and large connectivity, and yep. so they have, yep. yeah, they, they have, have like results. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 